We're pleased to welcome Ivan Chu here today at our Aviation Leader Series Luncheon. Uh, Ivan is the Chief Executive of Cathay Pacific Group. He's also Chairman of Hong Kong Dragon Airlines and is a Director of John Swire & Sons and Swire Pacific Limited. Cathay Pacific Group includes Dragon Air and Air Hong Kong. Uh, and in total has uh, 180 destinations in 46 countries. They are truly a global airline and have been for many years. In fact, in this year's annual Skytrax World Airline Awards, Cathay Pacific was once again named the world's best airline. Sorry, Dave Barger, Cathay Pacific is the world's <laughs> best airline. And not only that, but it's actually it's the fourth time that Cathay received that honor, the only airline in the world to achieve that feat. Um, Ivan joined Cathay in 1984, and the only company he's worked for, he tells me, but he has worked around the patch. He's worked in Hong Kong, on mainland China, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, and in Australia. Prior to his current position as chief executive, Ivan was the airline's COO. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO of the world's best airline, Ivan Chu. Thank you very much, Barry, for your kind introductions. First of all, it's really great to meet many of you here, uh, new friends, supporters, and customers, finally. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I must start by saying that what a personal great honor it is for me to be invited to address members of the Wing Club today. It's hard, I believe, uh, to imagine a group of people with more knowledge and insight into the world of aviation. I guess one of my major tasks today, which hopefully it is to build on this knowledge in a small way. The Wing Cups dated back to 1942, which is actually the same year that a young American pilot, Royal Roy Farrell, began his adventure in the Far East. Let's see, I can move this. Oops, yes, this is it. Farrell made a name for himself flying wartime surprise during the Second World War over the Hump. The Hump is a treacherous route from Calcutta to Kunming that tests every skills of those piloting the C-47, the military versions of the DC-3 passenger aircraft. Farrell flown together in the Second World War with a dashing Australian pilot, Sidney De Kenjo. After hostilities had ceased, the two of them decided to go into a partnership together. The fruit of that partnership was a flattening airline established in Hong Kong in 1946, which they called Cathay Pacific Airways. We are now 68 years old now. I have started off with the history for two reasons. First, I am immensely proud to be the chief executive of Cathay Pacific, that once faggling airline 68 years ago, is now one of the world's most regarded international airlines. Second, the story highlights an American connection for Hong Kong's home carrier. That connection was there at the beginning in the shape of Royal Farrell, who not only helped us to get off the ground, but also bought our very first aircraft, a second-hand DC-3 named Betsy in the United States. And the connection is very much alive and well today in America as we are growing our part of the network. Indeed, Cathay Pacific is now one of the biggest carriers of people and freight between the United States and Asia. And our presence here is growing all the time. Today, I'd like to take you through Cathay Pacific's journey in North America, explaining how we are building bridges between the world's largest economy and the surging economies in the Far East. I will talk about the Asian market, and in particular, the phenomenal growth of China. I will trace how Hong Kong has grown into one of the world's biggest aviation hubs 
punching well above its weight in global terms, and explain more about the role of Cathay Pacific in its success. In 1980, Cathay Pacific was beginning to spread its wings. We have already built a reputation as a regional carrier, but it has become clear that the future of our business lay beyond the boundary of Asia. As more 747 came to our fleet, we began to explore new destinations in Europe. Then in, 18, in 1986, we celebrated our first entry in the US market with a new daily service to San Francisco, while Vancouver. Around that time, under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, China embarked on historical economic reforms which drove landmark changes in the world's most populous nations. China never looked back. Those reforms began to take full effect in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, and so did the growth of the so-called Asia Tigers economies. The movement of people and goods between the Far East and West began to grow at a rapid pace. The upswings in Cathay Pacific's trans-Pacific business ran in parallel with these positive developments in Asia. We were able to use Hong Kong's unique geographical position to good advantage in building new lanes for passengers and cargo between Asia and North America. The work is still ongoing as connections between the world's two biggest economies continue to flourish. There's a lot of speculation about when China will overtake the United States as the world's largest passenger market. The recent IATA report suggests that this could take place by 2030. But the key point to note, I believe, is that the US and China are expected to remain the world's largest market by a considerable margin. Ever since launching the first flight in 1986, Cathay Pacific has taken every opportunity to tap into the American market. We suspended our first San Francisco service in 1990, but began non-stop operation to Los Angeles the same year. New York was added in 1996 Tech into our Vancouver service. And two years later, we are back flying to San Francisco, this time non-stop. New York non-stop service begin, began in 2004. Chicago became our fourth passenger destination in the United States in September 2011. And Newark Liberty joined our network last year. In May next year, we will be launching a new flight to Boston, Massachusetts, catering for the ever-increasing flow of students, business people, and tourists for Asia. At the same time as we build our network, we have also been adding more and more frequencies. We now have five flights every day into New York, including the service to Newark. We also operate four times daily into Los Angeles. From a one flight a week back in 1996, 1986, we now have 87 passenger flights a week into the US, and a grand total of 104 flights from into North America, all operated by the super efficient Boeing 777-300 Yards. In 1997, the first year of a full year service of, for New York, we carry 135,000 passengers to and from the US. But in the first nine months of this year, we carry a total of 5.4 million people. Quite a big job, carrying half of the size of the New York population in the first nine months of the year across the Pacific. We have taken a different approach for many airlines, we put a strong focus on frequency and connectivities. As a hub carrier, this gives us a unique advantage. On our New York route, for example, business tra travelers in particular 
like the convenience of flight flight a day with departures and arrivals at different times of the day, and connections to all points in the Asia-Pacific region through the Hong Kong hub. This is one of the reasons why we put such a big emphasis on building frequencies around our network. Travelers like to have choice. One question I often got asked is, why doesn't Cathay Pacific buy the 380s? And I think this is part of the answer. Sorry, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> From our point of view, operating five 777s a day is far more preferable to operating one or two A380s because we can give our customer more choices, more flexibilities, and a whole lot more options to connect elsewhere in our network. The demand is there, and we are putting in whatever capacity we can to move the people between North America and various destinations in Asia. And it's a similar story for the cargo side of our business. You, it may not be as sexy. I thought this is quite a sexy picture, by the way. <laughs> or headlight grabbing. But air rate remains hugely important to what we do. And North America is the key focus for Cafe Pacific's cargo business. You are well, all well aware of the downturn in the world's cargo market in the last three years. It has been a difficult time, I would say, for all air freight carriers, though there are good signs that the market may be back on an upward trajectory. One thing remains very clear. North America is where the future lies for our cargo business, and in particularly capturing the huge two-way flow of goods between China and the US. Yes. It is increasingly a two-way flow. While this trade flow has been built largely on the outflow of goods from the key manufacturing regions in the mainland of China, now we are seeing more high-end consumer goods moving in the opposite directions as China's middle class grows in both numbers and spending power. As trade between Asia and North America grows, Cathay Pacific's expand this new network and support the flow of goods in both directions. We now operate our state-of-the-art Boeing 747-shaped faders to 14 different points in North America, Calgary, Canada being the latest destinations. We will have 16 cargo points in next years. For a normal week in November like this one, we will have operated 40 freighters to North America together with our 104 passenger aircraft. We carry over 9,500 tons of cargo to and from North America, which I believe equal to the weight of about 73 million pieces of iPhone 6, by the way. <laughs> so quite a lot of stuff. Hong Kong. The foundation to everything we do in North America is the hub advantage Cathay Pacific enjoy in our home city, Hong Kong. In 1946, when our airlines was first found, Hong Kong was just beginning to recover from the crippling effect of World War II. Ever since that point, the fortune of Cathay Pacific has been, with Hong Kong has been intricately linked. Though we have been growing together with Hong Kong. Cathay Pacific has always stand on its own feet. We have never asked for nor received government support or subsidies of any kind. We are a purely commercial enterprise that lives or dies on our ability to generate profits and grow the business. We are fortunate to have great support from our shareholders. We have been helped by being based in the cities which is also one of the world's biggest financial centers and corporate regional headquarters. Hong Kong may have been in the news for all the wrong reasons of late, but let me assure you, there is no better place to run a business or run an airline. Here are a few reasons why. The, real, the rule of law is paramount. Hong Kong people are hardworking and resourceful. The city has a capable and competent civil uh, service and sound regulatory framework. And from an airline's point of view, we have been benefited from a liberal aviation policies. For example, between Hong Kong and the United States of America, 
any number of US and Hong Kong airlines can operate any numbers of services between the two places. We also have the infrastructure needed to get the job done too. The key part of this infrastructure was provided in 1998 when Hong Kong opened its new international airport then. A major statement of intent from a government that foresaw the economic benefit of building Hong Kong into an economic hub. Hong Kong enjoys specific advantage in its geographical locations. Not only does the city sit on the edge of the world's fastest growing economy, China, but half of the world's population live within five hours fine time of Hong Kong. Hong Kong has used its advantage to superb effect. Last year, close to 60 million people went through this building. This is the terminal of the Hong Kong International Airport. The airport was ranked third in terms of international passenger traffic behind only London Heathrow and Dubai. And once again, Hong Kong International Airport was the number one air freight hub in the world. A big achievement for a relatively small city of only seven million people. Cathay Pacific is very proud to be that part of the success. Every successful hub needs a strong and expansive home-based carrier. At Cathay Pacific, we've always been unequivocal about our support for and commitment to our home cities. In 1986, the year when we start our first flight to the US, we only carried 4.2 million passengers and had 21 aircraft in our fleet. Last year, together with our sister airline Dragonair, we carried close to 30 million passengers in our combined fleet with of about 180 aircraft. In 1986, we served only 36 destinations. Now, we serve 180. New points are being added all the time. Very soon, Manchester, Zurich, Boston will go online. We have grown, grown in parallel with Hong Kong, and our strategies has always been consistent. To develop the city's hub through a big network, a modern aircraft, a modern fleet, and superior product and services. Despite being totally independent commercial air enterprise, Cafe Pacific has made huge investment to support Hong Kong. The latest being the opening of a state-of-the-art $800 million cargo terminal, which is already reducing transit time and making Hong Kong a more attractive proposition for shippers and forwarders alike. But now we are facing a big challenge. The Hong Kong hub has become a victim of its own success. Growth has far outstripped original expectation, and it is expected that the airport will reach capacity under the current two run rate system between 2016 and 17. A proposal to build a third run rate is now being discussed after a prolonged debate on the environmental impact. Discussion will soon begin on how the project is going to be funded. Once approval is given, the, the runway will take about 10 years to build. This means Hong Kong will be operating a considerably constrained facilities for a long period of time. The economic impact of any delay is really big. Aviation generates 8% of Hong Kong's GDP and around 8% of the jobs. Until the third runway is completed, Hong Kong is going to lose ground to other rival hubs in the regions. One of the advantages of Hong Kong hubs has been its connections with the mainland of China. The economic whirlwind may have been tail off a little, but this is still well and truly China century. The statistics about aviation in the country continue to be mind blowing. China is already the world's biggest exporter of tourists at 100 million a year. It is expected to top 200 million by the end of the decade. Travel and tourism in the mainland 
are already substantial, and the projection for the future is staggering as urbanization continues and the spending powers continue to rise. How do these people travel overseas? Many by air, of course, and a substantial number of them go via Hong Kong. Cathay Pacific has a serious intention to be part of the success story for, Catholic, for the Chinese outbound travel. Hong Kong International Airport is connected to 40 points in the mainland of China, and our own subsidiary, Dragon Air, has a network of 22 cities in the country, more than any other non-mainland Chinese carriers. 2006 was a landmark year for Cathay when we bought Dragon Air into the group, and at the same time, launched a strategic partnership of Air China that has been fruitful for both airlines. Over, for the, over for the past eight years, we have seen significant growth of the mainlands to all points. On the US routes, for example, we have seen 400% growth in the number of passengers carried to and from the mainland. One point to add is that while this may be the China century, other countries within Asia is also gearing up for a more prosperous future. India may have yet to live up to its full potential after earning its BRIC status, but the latent potential in this land of a billion plus population is enormous. India is just five hours away from Hong Kong. Indonesia is now the biggest economy in Southeast Asia and a fast emerging manufacturing center with an increasing wealthy and mobile populations. Indonesia is just a four hour flight from Hong Kong. The Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Singapore, all are emerging markets with real potentials and around two to three hours flight time from Hong Kong. The potentials is enormous and Hong Kong is right in the heart of all this new era of air travel. From a Cathay Pacific perspective, our approach going forward will be the same, to continue to grow the airline, providing superior products and services, and maintaining our commitment to the Hong Kong hub. We are putting serious money where our mouth is. In this respect, we have 19 new wide-body aircraft on firm orders including the state-of-the-art Airbus 350-900 and 1000 and the Boeing 777-9X. Our investment in products, new lounges and innovative aircraft cabin is ongoing, while our unique service straight from the heart service ethos that we have been using for more than 10 years have been winning the hearts and minds of passengers. People have noticed the effect we have made this year, travelers from around the world have voted Cathay Pacific World Best Airlines in 2014 and our fourth time to receive this great honor. Well, being named the World Best certainly motivates us for the future. But we would be foolish to expect any easy why. We are all well aware of the challenge that this industry is facing. Growing competitions, declining yields, volatile fuel price, and then there are the securities uh, issues, environmental and regulatory issues. Put simply, aviation is never going to be an easy business. Well, nor it is an easy business to give up. As Robert Six, founder of the Continental Airlines says, I've never known an industry that can get into the people's blood the way aviation does. As someone who has been in the business for the last 30 years, I just cannot agree more. Ladies and gentlemen, aviation is certainly in the blood of Cathay Pacific Airways. We will continue to reach for the skies, and the United States of America will play a big part in our success story. Thank you very much.
We have a few minutes. If anybody would like to uh, pose some questions to Ivan, please. Have a question on uh, the bilateral between Hong Kong and the US, mainland China and the US. Are those separate bilateral agreements? And, um, and is there any chance they can be, if they are, can they be combined? And, and what's the future of bilateral agreements? Is there going to be an, a, an easing of mainland China to the US so more flights uh, can be allowed? And, and is that an opportunity or a risk for you? All right. Thank you for these questions. Uh, the uh, bilateral group, uh, uh, it's the, for the Hong Kong, US bilateral is separate from that of China, first of all. Uh, it is in, enshrined in the so-called basic law, which is the constitution for Hong Kong. So Hong Kong government is allowed to enter into bilateral agreement with another state, another country, another government to set up its aviation service. So the current aviation relationship, which governed uh, the um, the operation of air services, whether they be passenger and cargo, is governed by the United States uh, and Hong Kong agreement. And we see that agreement to be a very liberal agreement. Uh, it is very open, actually, between Hong Kong and US. As I mentioned just now, there's no restrictions. So that provides opportunities for any number of carriers, find any number of services uh, between uh, the United States and uh, and uh, Hong Kong. At the same time, it also pro to provide uh, some opportunities of uh, extension and, and also intermediate stopover and uh, uh, facilities, which had been used by uh, many of the US carriers. And in fact, one of the Cafe Pacific service fly by Vancouver to uh, New York, and we have full traffic rights between Vancouver and New York. So passengers can fly back and forth between uh, New York and Vancouver. Uh, even without flying to Hong Kong. Uh, so uh, that is, um, I think, a very good agreement, I would say. So, okay, um, good. I, Ivan, don't go away. Um, I need to present you with the Wings Club plaque. Good. So to thank you very much for joining us, Ivan, and uh, for giving us this great education on Cathay Pacific. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.